Greetings to you, Beulah Land Church. I'm excited to be able to share in this great conference, and I'm amazed at how we're able to connect virtually. After all we've experienced in 2020, um, my mind is blown how, how the Lord has given the church wisdom uh, to pivot, to adjust, and to remain faithful to our mission and our vision. Listen, I greet you from North Georgia. I'm born and raised in the Atlanta area. My name is Dr. Darrell Hall, and I have the delight of serving as the campus pastor uh, at the Elizabeth Baptist Church here in the Atlanta area. And I want to say thank you, uh, first and foremost, not only to God for this opportunity to share with you, but to your wonderful pastor, Pastor Carlos Kelly, Sister Kelly, their two sons. Uh, we acknowledge and honor the Kelly family, and we thank God for your awesome leader. What a wonderful man of God, a great preacher, and uh, and a great man of wisdom. Uh, my wife and I had the opportunity to uh, to meet he and his wife earlier this year. Uh, by chance, it seemed, uh, but it's apparent now in hindsight that it was orchestrated by the Lord. And as we sat there at the table um, just to get to know each other, uh, him and his wife were so encouraging and so warm. And just to watch their authentic uh, love for one another and respect for one another is something that was impressed upon me and my wife. And uh, we walked away from the table uh, as a younger married couple inspired and thankful to God for such a wonderful witness uh, that we had in, uh, in Pastor Kelly and Sister Kelly. So Pastor Kelly, man, I thank you. Uh, you don't even know how in that one conversation uh, you struck a chord in my heart and, uh, and I have a tremendous respect for you, not just as a pastor and preacher, but as, as the man of God in your home who, uh, who leads your wife and your children uh, in a way that pleases the Lord. Well, listen, I have an assignment today uh, to share with you from this simple thought and theme called adulting. And so uh, I'm excited to share it. Uh, it's something that I've experienced. I myself, I'm in the middle of it. I'm 34 years old. Uh, and so to those who may be a bit younger than me, I have I have been and might be where you currently are. And so for the next few minutes we have to share together, I'm going to share from my heart and from God's word on this simple thing uh, of adulting. And then after we're done, I'll look forward to being able to dialogue with you all live. Uh, in a live format. And so I'm thankful for, for the way this whole conference has been set up to allow not only me this opportunity to share, but also post this video, an opportunity to hear from you and engage with you deeper. So any questions you have, by all means, write them down. Uh, I'll try to share with you from an open heart and, uh, and hopefully the Lord will do something amazing uh, during our few minutes to, uh, to help you along the way. Before we dive in, let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we we're amazed uh, at you and how you have repositioned us uh, to continue to make uh, an impact on the kingdom of God and to continue to change lives for middle Georgia. I thank you, God, for the Beulah Land Church. I thank you for his mission. I thank you for his people. I thank you for his leadership and his pastor. And I'm grateful for this conference, which is uh, just another opportunity for us to gather together, uh, to hear from you, to worship you and to be stretched and our understanding of what it means to live lives that please you. That's our ultimate desire, oh God, that you be glorified. Now, Lord, as we share for a few minutes on this daunting topic of adulting, uh, many 20-somethings and teenagers and 30-somethings, even 40 and 50-year-olds are still just trying to adjust to what it looks like and what it means to truly be uh, grown up, mature, independent in this season and in this age. And so we're in desperate need of your wisdom to guide us and to help us. May your name be glorified and may these your people be edified. It's in Jesus' name we pray that of your heart's sake. Amen. Uh, again, our topic today is, uh, is adulting. You know, it used to be a lot simpler uh, to grow up, at least I've heard, than it is now. Uh, younger people and younger generations face obstacles and social cultural factors that quite frankly were just not in play some 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so I acknowledge from the outset that if you're listening to, uh, to this video and you may be younger than me in age, uh, I still have a tremendous respect for what you have to overcome in your world that I didn't have to overcome in my world. I'm, I'm, I'm 34, meaning I'm relatively young, but I'm just old enough to have firsthand knowledge of some of the progressions that have uh, added complexity to our culture. I can remember being a little boy and my mom had a, a beeper. 
<laughs> if you don't know what a beeper is, a beeper or a pager uh, is, is just a little communication device that when you when you call the number, uh, it will show that number on a screen with a loud beep sound to the person who owns it to inform them that they need to stop whatever they're doing uh, to call whoever uh, just reached out to them. And so when me and my younger sisters were home or uh, somewhere apart from our mom and we needed her, we would pick up a landline. That means a phone in the house. <laughs> we would dial her pager number. Uh, and if it was an emergency, we would put 911 in it. And uh, when we hit enter, we would have to wait for her wherever she was to receive the beat. Then she would have to stop, go to a pay phone, put a quarter in, call us and see what the problem was. I mean, we are worlds away from that now, aren't we? Uh, now we have phones in our hands that are literally everything we need them to be. Uh, no longer do we need to connect to a phone that's connected to a house to send a beep or a page to somebody who is geographically um, distant from us and then wait for them to call. I mean, today we can just pick up a phone and video chat, video call, FaceTime. This progression in technology is just one way uh, that our culture has been made more complex and our world has shifted. I can recall a time as a boy when uh, if I was in class and I had a crush on a girl, I would simply write a note to her or tell somebody to tell somebody. Uh, and, uh, and if something embarrassing happened to me at school, then the only people who would know about it is the people who were there to witness it. <laughs> but in this day and time with the Internet and with smart devices and with social media, uh, you can connect, DM, fall in somebody DMs, holler at somebody you're trying to connect to. And if something embarrassing happens to you, God forbid somebody else has a phone and records it. Uh, it can be posted, uploaded, and on the internet seemingly forever. So I acknowledge how complex our culture and society is and how this has made it difficult um, for, for young people to really become adults. To the extent now, uh, generations are finding it hard to relate to one another. And some of the research I've done uh, for a book I'm writing, uh, I've come across these two terms. Uh, helicopter parents and boomerang children. Uh, if you've never heard the term helicopter parents and boomerang children, let me break it down for you real quick. Helicopter parents are those parents who hover over their children that even when they become of age where they should be able to become independent, their parents still kind of hover over them and take care of them financially, figure out all their issues, pay half of or most of or all of their bills. Those are called helicopter parents. Boomerang children are those children that you throw out into the world to go to college, hopefully. And uh, even after they get a college degree or maybe two, for some reason, they just boomerang and come on back home and willingly, gladly sleep in the same room they did as, uh, as high school students. This is a cultural phenomenon that has rocked not only uh, the church, it has rocked our homes and our communities. Now, I state this not necessarily as a negative thing, but as a factual thing for us to take into uh, consideration as we discuss this whole meaning of what it means to become an adult. Because see, it's not just as simple as it used to be. It used to be you were a baby, then you were a child, and then you were an uh, adult. By 18 years old, you were out on your own, right? Many of our grandparents, great aunts and uncles, graduated high school and never went back home. And then you just became an adult. You took care of yourself and you made it work. Now, sociologists have tried to help capture how complex life stages are to the extent that life stages have now adjusted from a simple baby, child, adult, elder to now you got a baby who becomes a preteen. Mind you, now this concept of a teenager or adolescent didn't exist 100 years ago. So you got a baby who becomes a child, who becomes a preteen, who becomes a teen, who becomes a young adult. So these young adults between 18 and maybe 23, and that age and stage is cut off by typically graduating from college or finishing the first four years of, uh, uh, of their commitment, perhaps to the military. And then at 23, they, they, they become emerging adults. So now from 23 to 29, you got this concept of an emerging adult, which is somebody who's old enough to take care of themselves, but not financially independent enough to take care of themselves. That season is typically about 23 to 29. And then at 30 now, you become an adult. And, and this adult stage, sociologists are marking it at around 30 because this is around then that maybe you get your own mortgage or your own place, start paying your own bills. And if you get married 
and have children. That's about when on an average basis. You would think somebody would become an adult and stay an adult and that's it, right? No, not necessarily. At 55 now, sociologists have put in this other level called second adulthood. That's where a lot of our parents and aunts and uncles are. That means at about 55, maybe 60, you're too young to be old, but you're too old to be young. <laughs> You've done something now for about 25, 30 years, whether that's work or job that you retired from, took care of children that you raised, they've grown and gone. But yet you're still young enough and have enough energy and vibrancy to have a whole nother life after the life you knew as a younger adult. And so it's become tremendously complex. And I've done my very best to try to explain it, at least in a cursory format. But I've also included it uh, in a PowerPoint presentation that I've sent along with, uh, with this video. So if you want to go back in and look at that, hopefully it'll give some insight to how complex our world is. I said all that to say this. It's important, young people, that we do embrace the struggle of adulting. Here's why. Because God created everything with the appearance of maturity and the ability to reproduce something that would itself mature. <laughs> Let me say that again. God, in the beginning, created everything with the appearance of maturity, also the ability to reproduce something that would itself mature. What you mean? Uh, in Genesis 1, when God created Adam and Eve, uh, they were not babies. He created them as full-grown, mature adults with the ability to reproduce more children, expecting those children to mature into adults. When he created the trees, he didn't create a little shrub. He created full-grown orange trees already blooming with oranges. Those oranges were full of seeds. Those seeds had the potential to be sown in the soil and to mature into orange trees. So maturity has been a part of creation from the very beginning. And so here we now are in 2020, and though it may be more complex, that does not make it impossible. But the reality is, it's hard for us, if we're honest, to mature in every area of our life as we could because of the simple fact that we are limited in our capacity. You see, you get to a point where you should be independent, and then you look at the things that you don't know that you which you did know, and at times that can be a part of the frustration, right? Yeah, you may be 21, 22, 23, but do you really know how to manage money? Do you really know how to maintain a flourishing, healthy, romantic relationship? You're a believer at 25, but do you really know how to read the Bible for yourself, understand it, and continue to grow spiritually? A part of our frustration with trying to become mature adults is we're limited in our capacity, Though we may be strong in some areas, we may be embarrassingly weak in others. And we may not say it to, to, out loud and may not be honest about it, but to ourselves, we may feel this sense of being overwhelmed. That trying to go it alone just seems so daunting because of our fear of what we lack. It is not just that we are limited. Some of us have also been abandoned. We've been abandoned functionally. <laughs> Or some of us have been abandoned actually. What you mean actually? I mean actually left by the people who were supposed to care for us, train us up, and help us mature. But then some of us have been functionally abandoned. What does that mean? To be functionally abandoned means that they were present physically, but they were not present emotionally. So what do I do? Yeah, I know my age says that I'm supposed to be an adult by now, but I still got emotional scars and wounds from, from a parent or aunt or uncle or a big brother who was there physically, but not really there emotionally and spiritually to help me develop even mentally. And so when it comes to adulting, we find it quite frankly, overwhelming. Listen, I've been there uh, and, and I am touched with the feelings of those infirmities. When I was born, my parent, parents were teenagers. My mom was 15, my dad was 19. Um, I lived in a single parent home. By the time my mom was 28, she had four children. Um, uh, my dad and mom never married. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, my dad moved away and though he's a great man, we have a magnificent relationship now because he was in the military. Many of the years of my childhood, we didn't live in the same house, city, state, or even country. And so when I was coming of age, trying to figure out how to become this man, how to adult, who did I have to turn to? You would not believe this. Uh, you might laugh at me because I'm a church boy, born and raised. But what I would do as a teenager is something we about to do together. All right, y'all don't laugh at me. I'm going to tell y'all what I used to do as a teenager because I was so afraid 
that I didn't know the secret to becoming a man and I didn't have a father that would tell me. Uh, I started reading the Bible on my own. And one of my favorite books of the Bible is the book of Proverbs. <laughs> We're going to read through some of the Proverbs today. Hopefully it'll blow your mind the way it blew my mind. But Proverbs is a book written from a father to his son, full of wise sayings to help his son become an adult, to help his son mature. And so I would read it emotionally like this was my dad writing to me, even though I didn't have my dad there to teach me these lessons. I would read it as if this was a personal letter from my dad to me and, and it really impacted my life. It's amazing when you read through uh, through Proverbs because I realized that really Solomon had the first Twitter account. I don't know if you're on Twitter or not, but it's amazing what some people can do with 140 characters, jokes they can tell, narratives they can form, uh, clapbacks they can give to folks who, 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 who called them out. Uh, but the first Twitter account was Proverbs. Solomon, he, all these tweets should be on Proverbs. You know why? Because Solomon was the first person to show us really how much insight you can pack into 140 characters. A lot of them you read is just mind blowing. Some of them we're going to read today. And what I believe these Proverbs do is they give us the wisdom we need to become the mature adults that we're seeking to become. Here's the big question that we're going to answer, answer in a simple way through Proverbs. And then we'll spend some time together in our dialogue talking about them too. Here's the big question. If there's nothing else that we ask, many of us have probably asked this, right? In trying to become adults, here's the question. How can I always know what I should do in any situation? How can I always know what I should do in any situation? And because we fear that we don't always know what to do in any situation, that becomes a barricade to our ability to mature past where we are. I believe that Proverbs gives us the secret to always know what we should do in any situation. And that secret is this wisdom. That's it. It's wisdom. Say it with me. Wisdom. <laughs> wisdom is the secret to know what I should do in just about every situation of my life. And so let's go through a few areas in our life where we need wisdom in order to uh, become the adults that God has ordained for us to become. We're going to go through spiritual wisdom. Then we're going to look at relational wisdom. Then we're going to talk about financial wisdom. Then we're going to talk about sexual wisdom. Then we're going to talk about vocational wisdom. And then we're going to be done. All right. We got a little bit of time and a long way to go. So I hope y'all can rock with me. Here's the first thing we need. If we're going to know what we should do in every situation of life, number one, we need spiritual wisdom. Proverbs chapter one, verse number seven says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The key word in that verse is fear. In order to successfully adult, <laughs> we need spiritual wisdom and the beginning of spiritual wisdom is fear. Now, when I was younger, I, I I didn't understand this word fear. Like, why would I be scared of God? He's not the boogeyman, right? He's supposed to be good. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. That word fear doesn't mean morbid fear, like how you have for, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, Jason Voorhees chasing you with a hockey mask on. <laughs> it don't mean that kind of fear. It means respect and reverence. The secret to spiritual wisdom is to respect and and reverence God. Now, how can I know that I truly have the fear of God in my heart? I believe the secret to having a fear of God, at least from my experience uh, as a 20 something now, 30 something is this. You know, you fear God by what you decide about what you think about. See, all of us have thoughts we can't control. But the question is, what is your decision on that random thought that just jumped in your head? Because the fear of God starts inside, in the place where nobody can see. So if I think a random thought, do I agree that it's wrong or right? Or do I assume that just because it entered my mind, it must be okay? The fear of God will make me make a decision about something I just randomly thought about. All right, here's another way I know if I fear God. The motives behind my moves. Mm. See, social media is full of people who moving and shaking. And got you thinking you need to make these big boss moves if you're going to truly be who you want to be. But rarely do they ever talk about the motives behind those moves. What are my motives? 
Remember, the fear of God starts inside before it comes outside, but it doesn't stay inside. It's proven by what you do outside. So what do I decide about what I think about? What are the motives behind my moves? Here's another thing that tells me if I fear God, what do I do to people on a consistent basis? How I treat people on a consistent basis proves if I fear God or not. Right. No matter who those people are, whether they're in authority above me or whether they just some random person I met or whether they are beneath me socially. How I treat people on a consistent basis proves if I fear God or not. If I treat people bad, like dirt, step over people, misuse people, then it shows I don't fear God. But when I treat all people with dignity and respect, despite their age and stage, whether they are older or younger, I understand that the same God who made me made them. And so I treat them with that dignity. All right. What do I decide about what I think about? What are the motives behind my moves? What I do to people on a consistent basis and what I say to people on a consistent basis. <laughs> See, if I sit around you for a week and listen to your normal conversation, that would give me a telltale sign of really what's going on inside of here and inside of here. So the words I use and the actions I take on a consistent basis flow from my motives and really betray or expose what's going on in my mind. And when I, when I address all of that, inside of me that lets me know I got spiritual wisdom. It lets me know I fear God. Not just spiritual wisdom. Here's the second thing, relational wisdom. Woo! <laughs> we all need relational wisdom, don't we? All right. The first verse I read was in Proverbs chapter one, verse number seven about the fear of God. Now let's look at Proverbs chapter one, verses eight through 16. I'm not going to read them all. We don't have enough time. Let me just read a few of the verses in Proverbs one. Relational wisdom is based on my ability, listen to me, to be picky, all right? I gotta be picky in two ways. I gotta be picky over who I won't be around, and I gotta be picky over who I will be around. If it, let me run that back. If I'm gonna have relational wisdom, I gotta be picky. Picky over what? Who I won't be around, and picky over who I will be around. What you mean who I won't be around? Proverbs chapter one, verse number 10 says, my son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, my son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths for their feet rush into evil. They are swift to shed blood. Whew. Are you running with people that you really know you shouldn't be around? Did you assume that just because they enticed you? And invited you that you had to participate? Just because somebody invites you to be down don't mean you got to give in. You got to be picky over who you won't be around. But you also got to be picky over who you will be around. Proverbs 24 verse number 6 says, Surely you need guidance to wage war and victory is won through many advisors. Whew, did you hear that word? Advisors. In chapter 1 he said, Don't hang around sinners. In chapter 24, verse 6, he said, hang around advisors. All right? We got to be picky over not being around folk who are wasting their time doing stuff we know we shouldn't be doing. But we got to be picky over who we are around, and that is people who are advisors, meaning the people I run with should make me wiser. I should learn something. I should be challenged to grow. I should be pushed to become. I should be encouraged to fulfill my purpose. That's what an advisor is. Now, typically, you, you would find advisors and folk who are older than you because they've been there and done that. But there may be some peer advisors, meaning people your age that you can learn from. That's very important. Be picky over who you won't be around. Be picky over who you will be around. Whew, I went through a lot with friends in my life. Um, uh, and at around 30 years old, I learned a very hard lesson about how to pick friends. I realized that as a teenager... And a 20 something, I made the mistake of thinking that because people were around me, they were just like me. Now at 30, I realize it's not about people who are just around me. I need to look for people who are like me and like who I want to be. Meaning what? Don't just choose your friends off of vicinity. Choose your friends based on values. Don't miss what I just said. Don't choose your friends off of vicinity. Choose your friends based on values. 
Just because y'all are around the same place don't mean they're the type of person that you want to become. Yeah, y'all may go to school together. They may even go to church with you. Yeah, you may see them in some social environments. That's vicinity. But vicinity doesn't mean that they really got the same values you do. Learn how to choose your friends based on values, who they are from the inside out, the way they make decisions, the way they move, the motives behind what they do. And what you'll discover then is you have relational wisdom. It's crazy now because uh, I'm a down south Georgia boy. I'm born and raised in the ATL. You know what to do, right? I'm an ATL Georgia boy for sure, right? And as you can tell, I'm a black man. But uh, I got a lot of black friends. But these days, probably my best friend is a left-handed white boy from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He also happens to be my barber. I hope my hairline clean. <laughs> my, my best friend is a white boy from Pennsylvania, and I'm a black boy from Georgia. What would cause a black boy from Georgia and a white boy from Pennsylvania to become really good friends? I tell you what, it's not vicinity, it's values. It's values. That's relational wisdom. All right, we talked about spiritual wisdom, fear the Lord, relational wisdom, be picky. Who I am and who I'm not going to be around. Number three, let's talk about financial wisdom. All right, let's talk about the money. If it ain't about the money, <laughs> all right, we're going to talk about the money. A part of becoming an adult is having knowledge and wisdom over how to manage money. And that is an a, a education we just don't get, do we? We don't get a significant, robust financial education in our schools. Uh, on our chat later, if somebody asks, I'll share with you some books I've read and some things I'm trying to implement to grow in this area. But the book of Proverbs gives us some key ways we can grow in our financial wisdom. Here's the key, according to Proverbs, of how to grow financially. Earn, give, save and invest, and stay away from debt. I know it's simple, but that's what Proverbs is. Earn, give, save and invest, Stay away from debt. What you mean earn? Proverbs 14, 23. All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Meaning what? If you find a way to earn some money and it's legal and it's positive, even if you don't like it, do it. <laughs> earn. Earn your money. Even if it's what you feel like is beneath you for the moment. Earn it. A part of adulting is not needing somebody else to always pay my cell phone bill. <laughs> not living on handouts. Now, that's not to say people won't give you handouts to help you along the way, because Lord knows many people have helped me. But it is to say that my basic life and budget should be around what I earn. I should be going to work. Uh, me and my wife have been married since we were 21, and uh, we got three sons. We had a baby at 21, 23, and, uh, and 28. <laughs> so we've been struggling a long time. We've been struggling, but God's been good. I can recall my first job. Uh, my first job was 40 hours a week. I was making $9 an hour, no insurance uh, uh, for my wife and baby. We were living in a one bedroom apartment. The first baby boy, he, 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 he lived in a pack and play in the corner of our bedroom. My check was $90, uh, $900 and rent was 650. And we was tithing. <laughs> So I would get a $900 check, give 90 to the church, have $810, pay my, my rent for $650, and, and be there with $160 for the next two weeks trying to figure out how to make it work. But listen, when you earn, there's always honor in what you have earned. And so what I did was, because I wasn't making enough, I picked up a, a part-time job at Domino's. So here I am working a day job, $9 an hour, I go out to Domino's, and a part of my plan was to bring pizza home. You know what I'm saying? That's free dinner. So I got my tips. You know what I mean? Got my free pizza. And I was in school working on my seminary degrees because I knew ultimately my calling was to become a pastor and preacher. Uh, but at the time, Beulah Land wasn't inviting me. Didn't nobody know me. So I had to find a way to work hard to feed my family. And to this day, I don't regret it. Earn. Don't just earn. Give. See, the problem sometimes is we earn and we think everything we get is for us. And we consume. Mm -mm. But part of being great is being generous. And the secret to being generous is to give. Even before I give to myself. Uh, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflow and your vats will brim with new wine. Give to the Lord first. 
Why? Because a generous person will prosper, Proverbs eleven twenty five. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. When you get what you've earned, think about how you can first give. Because that is the true secret to significance and greatness. Not standing in line trying to buy the latest shoes or the latest this and latest that and consuming everything I make. Earn, give, and then also save and invest. All right, I'm just getting to the point in my life where this third one is becoming apparent to me. Because I got three kids who are growing up and I got parents who are getting older. And so I got to start saving and investing. Meaning everything I have, I can't spend on what I need today. I got to be wise to put it away. Proverbs 13, 11 says, dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever, whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Proverbs 13, 11. All right. And here's the last thing. Stay away from debt. Now, listen, debt is not sin, but it is dumb. <laughs> Proverbs 22, 7 says the rich rule over the poor. You want to be somebody's slave? If you don't, then try your best to stay out of debt. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Uh, the easiest debt I ever got in was uh, with student loans. Uh, I got an undergrad, two master's degree, and a doctor's degree, a doctorate degree. Thank God I only needed student loans for uh, for one semester. But that, that student loan money was easy to get into. I just signed how much I want, right? However much you want, put it on the paper, they'll give it to you. That's the easiest debt I ever got in. But the dumbest debt I ever got in, I'm just going to tell y'all. Y'all don't tell nobody, all right? If somebody laughing at me for what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to know that somebody at Beulah Land told them. The dumbest debt I ever got in was uh, I, I went in debt to buy a vacuum cleaner. Stupid. A Kirby vacuum cleaner. Idiot. $2,500. And it took me years to pay it off because that was a dumb decision. I'm just being honest with you. Do all you can to stay out of debt. All right. So we talked about spiritual wisdom. We talked about relational wisdom, financial wisdom. All right. Now let's talk about sexual wisdom, sexual wisdom. Proverbs talks all about it. I'm going to give you three ways to kind of help you know three questions you got to ask yourself if you want to have sexual wisdom. OK, here's the first question. They may be fine, but are they mine? <laughs> Woo! They may be fine, but are they mine? Proverbs 520. Why, my son? Why be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? Whew. What is he saying? He's saying you can see that she's fine, but she don't belong to you. Stay away from what's not yours. If it ain't yours, it's everybody's. Stay away from it. She may be fine. All right. They may be fine. He may be fine. But are they mine? If the answer to that is no. Then I'm going to try to use sexual wisdom. Here's the second question. How much do I want to be worth? See, sometimes we think that it's the clothes we put on that determine our worth. Mm -mm. It's what we do with our bodies that determine our worth. Proverbs 6.26 says, For the price of a prostitute reduces one to a loaf of bread, and an adulterous woman hunts for a precious life. What does that mean? That's saying, what it would cost you to live however you want to live sexually would reduce you to the value of a loaf of bread. Last time I went to Kroger, you can get some bread, 10 for 10. How much do you want to be worth? See, I know people will press you because they're trying to get you in the bed, but listen, once they've had you, they won't respect you. If you truly want to be respected and valued, keep what you got to you until the Lord give you somebody who can be yours and you can be theirs and y'all can do the doggone thing and give God praise. <laughs> All right. The first question is, they may be fine, but are they mine? The second question is, how much do I want to be worth? Here's the third question. Do I like drinking off the ground? If you were thirsty right now and somebody took a cup of water and poured it on the ground and told you to go drink it, would you want to drink off the ground? The question, the answer is no, right? Listen to Proverbs 5, 16. Should your springs overflow in the streets? Your streams of water in the public squares? Whew. He's telling his son, hey, man, your, your sexual life is like your water and your water is supposed to quench the thirst of your woman. But you out here in the streets pouring your water on the ground and wasting yourself. If you don't want to drink off the ground, why would you make the person you end up being with for long term drink off the ground? Keep it in the bottle. Keep it in the cup. And let them drink from that and praise God for it. You know what I learned uh, at 34 years old? If one is not enough, 
two never will be. <laughs> Think about what I just said. If you want sexual wisdom, if one is not enough, two will never be enough. If you can't choose that this one is, is, is more than what I can handle for the rest of my life, two never will be. Because if I get two, I'm going to want three. If I get three, I'm going to want four. You get the point. It requires self-discipline. And it requires me being able to say, listen, I want to be somebody of value. That's sexual wisdom. Here's the last thing, and I'm done. I've already went over my time. My apologies, uh, Pastor Kelly and, uh, and, and the leadership. Here's vocational wisdom. When I say vocational wisdom, I'm talking about how to grow in your job and in your career. Be punctual, be diligent, and be resilient. That's easy, right? Easier said than done. What you mean be punctual? Proverbs 24, 33 and 34 says, a little sleep and a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. He said, if you sleep too much, if you ain't never on time because you overslept all the time, you're going to end up being broken poor. So be punctual. Whatever you got to do, be on time, even if it's a job you don't like, because it's not about the job. It's about the character that you're developing to become the person you see yourself becoming. Be diligent. Proverbs 10, 4 says, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. What does that mean? Work like somebody is watching when nobody is watching. If you really want to be a boss, work like somebody watching when nobody watching. That's the key to being a boss. Because that diligence is what God will use to bless you. Be punctual. Be diligent. Here's the last thing. Be resilient. Be resilient. Y'all probably ain't never heard this, but the older generation be calling us millennials and Generation Z entitled. They think we lazy and they think we just want everything handled, handed to us that we didn't earn. But the way we can prove them wrong is we, we can be resilient. Meaning, I can keep working hard even when it's not easy. Not thinking that all of a sudden I'm going to wake up one day and be rich. But I have this internal fortitude that makes me strong to keep pushing forward even when it's difficult. Proverbs 6, 6 through 8 says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. The ant is used as a symbol of what it means to be resilient. You ever seen some ants working? If you seen some ants walking, carrying a sandwich, <laughs> and they walking, and you put a stick in their way, guess what they gonna do? Stop, go around the stick, and keep on walking. Ants are resilient. They don't stop just because it get hard. They keep moving, they just go around the obstacle, and they keep it moving. So whatever it is you face, when it comes to your work, be punctual, be diligent, be resilient. Listen, I'm done. Before I jump off, don't be like Peter Pan and the Lost Boys in Never, Never Never Land. They never wanted to grow up. They wanted to stay children forever. You got to leave Never Never Land. You got to come into the real world and you got to become an adult. Because God has a lot in you that he's planning to use in this world. And it's important that you embrace it all. See, the first step to becoming independent is to become mature. And in order to become mature, you need wisdom. Listen, thank you so much for allowing me to share. Again, I apologize for going over time. Uh, and I'm looking forward to our dialogue here in a minute. Any questions you have, by all means, ask them. Pastor Kelly, man, God bless you. Thank you again for the opportunity. May the good Lord bless you.